Excited to be here and to be having this conversation about breaking down structural and systemic racism for our children. Um, I'm Melissa Giroux. I'm a co-founder of Embrace Race. I'm also a multiracial black white mom. And I'm Andrew Grant Thomas. I am a co-founder of Embrace Race. We have children together. I identify as black or African-American. And our children are upstairs and very well trained not to disturb us <laughs> and, and able to not disturb us during this time these days. We're still working on it. Yeah. So uh, we're really excited to be here. And um, so Embrace Race is a community, most of you know, of support for people who want to raise kids who are informed, thoughtful, and brave about race. And uh, we chose those words very deliberately. And part of being informed and thoughtful and being able to, um, to ultimately be anti-racist, work against things and systems um, that discriminate by race, um, you need to know about uh, systemic racism, you need to know about structural racism. We're sort of using those ter uh, terms interchangeably, uh, but we're going to dig in today to what those mean, um, why it's important for us to talk to kids about them, and then how to talk to kids about them, how young, how to do it with the youngest uh, through the ages. And uh, we have two guests that we're really excited about. Um, we're gonna talk to them, Andrew and I are gonna talk to them for about half an hour, and then we're gonna open it up to your questions. Many of you sent in fantastic questions already. And um, we are excited to answer them and to hear some answers to them. Please be active in the chat. Um, it's a really hard question how to talk to kids about structural and systemic racism. And I'm sure a lot of you have other resources and have uh, comments, uh, best practices that you wanna share. Um, so we learn a lot from the chat. So please add your voice. So Andrew. And put, uh, as Melissa said, uh, engage each other in the chat. It's gold. Uh, since we've been getting more and more people, it's really an amazing conversation and exchange of resources and making connection that happens in the chat. Please put any questions that you might have for the second half of the program in the Q&A, you'll see that the chat uh, probably will move so quickly that it would be impossible for us to pull the questions from the chat. So please uh, do put them in the Q&A so that we can see them. We have two people, indeed two guests who have tried uh, to do this work, very thoughtfully tried to do this work of talking about structural racism, systemic racism, and engaging kids on those issues. Um, one, the first I'll introduce, Kimberly Narayan. Motivated by her own battle with chronic disease, Dr. Kimberly Narayan has devoted her career to ensuring that everyone has the opportunity to be healthy. She's a wife, a mother, an internal medicine physician, and a researcher focused on improving the health of underserved and under-resourced populations. Her primary research involves examining the health equity implications of social, economic, and health interventions among racial and ethnic minorities and individuals with low socioeconomic status. Kim, welcome and thank you for doing that work. Thank you for having me. And Michael Lawrence Riddell is an award-winning public school educator with 20 years of classroom experience. Michael founded Self-Evident Education in September of 2019. Michael, I thought it was Self-Evident Media. We, so we filed for uh, our articles of organization to become a 501c3, and we shifted to uh, education because we wanted the word education in the title okay. to clearly indicate. So good catch there. But yes, I'm already we, we learning. I'm already learning. <laughs> he found a self-evident self education in September of 2019 because he wasn't finding teaching materials that address the urgent need for our society to honestly and rigorously engage in work to understand the histories and legacies of race and institutional racism. Michael's foundation as an African-American studies major at Wesleyan University and as a teacher of American history also shapes his work. We're really delighted to have you both. And we dive right in with the place we often start from, which is what is it about your personal and or professional backgrounds that helps explain your investment in this question of how to educate children about structural and systemic racism. Kim, let me start with you. 
Yeah, I mean, I started delving into this issue, honestly, to help myself when everything happened, you know, over the summer with George Floyd and all the social unrest that followed, I had this feeling that there was just no way to avoid addressing the issue with my seven-year-old daughter, but I didn't really know how to do it. I knew I wanted to not make the conversation about bad people doing bad things. In my professional life, I spend the majority of my time thinking about the way that policies and laws impact people's ability to be healthy. And I focus on these things because I know that's what has the biggest outcome or the biggest impact on behaviors and outcomes. So I started thinking to myself, could this way of thinking be useful for my daughter uh, in terms of you know, having an ability to interpret what had happened with George Floyd, but not only with George Floyd, but with the additional events that we know, unfortunately, will come in the future. And that's what got me thinking about you know, if there are resources to try to help me have this discussion with my daughter. So I started going to our personal library. I started going online. And then I really just came to the conclusion that there was not much in the way of helping you know, discuss these issues with children. And then I started thinking I might have to create something myself. That is some serious can do. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you for doing that. Michael, what's your, what's your thought? Um, yeah, so I think I'll, I'll, I'm gonna rewind way back, right? And I think there's a danger when we, um, when we go to orig origin stories because at their worst, they can be reductive. Um, but at their best, they can be really powerful metaphors for how um, people or things came to be what they were, right? And so I'm an educator through and through. I, I knew from a really early age that I wanted to be an educator. Um, and when I, was, when I was young, when I was five years old, I was in kindergarten and I was invited to a friend of mine's birthday party. Um, and I knew exactly what I wanted to get him for his birthday party, the, the, the Dukes of Hazard. General Lee car. I was going to bring it to him for his birthday and I knew he would love it. And my dad said, Michael, you cannot bring that into your black friend's house. And uh, I was shocked, you know, taken aback. Why not? We, you know, we watch this show, we play it. It's on TV every night and or every week in our house. Um, and my father had a really open and honest conversation with me as a, as a five-year-old. You know, I don't remember all of the things that he said, but I really clearly remember him telling me that that car had a flag that represented an army that fought a war to enslave people who looked like my friend, right? And so uh, the honesty with which a person who loved me spoke to me with love about that moment. I think, you know, in looking back and reflecting, I think it's been really impactful on, on how I've lived my life. Um, and then fast forward to when I was in eighth grade um, in Amherst, Massachusetts, and one of my best friends was assaulted because of the color of his skin. He was, uh, had his kneecap dislocated, was, was called the N-word, told to go the F back to Africa. Um, and this, you know, I witnessed this uh, thinking, I think I had naively grown up thinking that racism happened, you know, back then and down there. Um, and seeing it happen right in front of me um, was this really uh, crystallizing moment for me. And so I, I decided to become a teacher to serve as a place, as a powerful lever, the way that it had served me to try to understand the way that racism functions in this country um, and to bring that into the classroom and to use the classroom or any sort of educative space as a, as a place where we can really understand the histories of, of what has brought us to today. Because if we don't understand the past, we can't understand today and we can't envision or even build, or, or we can't even envision a just future, much much less build it if we don't understand our past. So mm -hmm. that's, yeah, I think that's that's it for me, the power that education has played in my own life. And I really just wanted to to distill that and bring that to, to other people. So we'll, we'll get into that a little bit more. Just a quick follow-up, Michael. I'm wondering, so clearly your father, when you were five, had an immediate right. You're going to your friend's house, you're bringing this car. He, he felt a need to intervene in that moment. I'm just curious, uh, did those conversations continue? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I, you know, growing up, my dad was, um, was an economics professor um, at, uh, at Smith College. He, he was at Bucknell first when I was born and then at Smith College um, and, you know, was a radical socialist economist um, and spent a lot of time, you know, he brought us to the, um, to the, the, what was it? It must've been the, the 
20th, 25th anniversary of the March for Jobs and Justice in Washington. You know, we, we, we marched. Um, he founded an organization called um, the Center for Popular Economics that was housed at Hampshire College in, in Amherst. And it was an organization that was, uh, that was established to help social organizers understand economic systems in their fight for social justice. Um, so yeah, I definitely was raised by, by parents who, who made this part of their central mission to have these kinds of conversations with, with me and my brothers. Fabulous, fabulous. Trying to do the same. Uh, I didn't know you grew up in Amherst as well. Um, so structural racism, systemic racism, you each sort of use different terms than what we've read. Um, so I'm wondering if you can just give us a, you know, your explanation of what you mean by the term you prefer. And I'm going to start with Kim. Yeah, I, when I, you know, say structural racism, what I'm thinking about is the laws, the policies, the practices that lead to differential access to advantages and disadvantages. And when I'm speaking about advantages and disadvantages, I'm thinking about things like labor. So who has access to a high quality job? Who has access to start a business? I'm thinking about material goods. I'm thinking about who has access to safe and healthy environments. I'm also thinking about symbolic social goods. So I'm thinking about things like who has access to justice and democracy and how that breaks down by racial lines. And I use this you know, definition for a few different reasons. So one, because structural racism is the most important type of racism for impacting outcomes that we see today. So this is opposed to something like interpersonal racism, which is differential treatment from one individual to another as a consequence of their race. I also use it because it's the most difficult to detect. So you think about something like zoning, right? That might be totally innocuous on its face. We don't want, you know, more multi-unit, you know, dwellings in our neighborhood. But, you know, it's not, you know, obviously clear even how the support or the opposition of that now breaks down. It may be along racial lines, it may not. But yet and still the impact that these laws have is essentially keeping in place those differences in access to the neighborhood that go back to segregation. And then I'll say the last reason why I focus on structural racism is because understanding the way in which racism is so pervasive throughout all of American life starts to give people a sense of the type of solutions that would have to be implemented in order to actually increase the quality of opportunity across racial groups. So if you don't understand sort of the far reaching cross sector implications of racism, you might actually come to the opinion that something that's trying to actually redress inequity, something like affirmative action, you might actually think that's a racist policy. So it's important that we have, you know, this broader understanding of the way that racism operates. And Kim, do you use those phrases interchangeably, systemic, and or do you understand them systemic uh, interchangeably? Yeah, I, I see a lot of people in the literature are re using them interchangeably. Mm -hmm. um, Michael, anything? Do you have a different definition or something to add? Um, no, I mean I think similar to. Um, Kim, I, I see the words used and I use the words um, interchangeably, but I think it really is about the, the systems and the structures. And for me, it, it goes back as a, as a teacher and a student of, of history, um, I'm always looking for those narratives, those stories that we can find that help to illustrate the ways that race has been and, and racism has been systematized and, and created structures within our society. Um, there's a brilliant podcast um, called Seeing White, uh, Seen on Radio. Um, one of the co-hosts, Chendrai Kumanika, he talks, you know, really brilliantly and, and many others do as well about the ways that we currently exist within a culture where racist and oppressive outcomes exist without necessarily the need for individual racists, um, that, that they're so embedded within the structures and, and the outcomes. And I think Ibram Kendi, you know, does such a great job in, in his books um, in, in so many ways of showing how the racist ideas have come out of racist policies and not the other way around. I think that's 
oftentimes the sort of cultural story that we get told, we get told this story that the, the um, ideas of difference existed and then the policies sort of followed these, these ideas. And, and when in actuality, what Kendi shows so brilliantly in the past and in the present is the ways that these, the, the outcomes of the policies are, are what's important, right? And so if we can look at, um, you know, demographic information like Kimberly brought up, you know, we look at infant mortality rates and we look at, you know, life expectancy and income equality and or inequality and incarceration rates. And, and there are varied outcomes that can be predicted based on racial categories than we have racist policies in effect. And there need to be uh, discrete anti-racist systemic policies to undo that, right? And so one, um, one story I think from our history, which really helps to, to illustrate this is um, the ways that laws about race were formed in the colony of Virginia, right? So the colony of Virginia, the House of Burgesses is the first um, you know, representative governmental body in what become the American colonies. And so the laws that they establish about race then become uh, instrumental in the laws that get established about race in the other colonies, right? And um, so if we've got to un if we want to undo that, we've got to do it in a systemic way. And so right now, the state of Virginia has rewritten their um, social studies curriculum guidelines. Uh, one of the interns for Self Evident is in the room today, C Cambria Weaver, um, and she did this brilliant job going through their social studies um, frameworks and aligning them with the work that we're doing at Self Evident Education. And they have a standard where they 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 name that exact thing. They say the ideas and laws about race that became central to American beliefs about race came out of the colony of Virginia, right? And so the, the state of Virginia is acknowledging the fact that their you know, ancestry, that, that, that the, the, one of the legacies of the founding of Virginia has been the ways that racist ideas have been embedded in all of our systems and structures. Um, and so, you know, there's, there's, uh, I, I think there are some positive and hopeful ways that uh, systems thinking is being used to undo the ways that racial disparities and inequities have been systematized in, in this country. It's going to take a long time yeah. um, to do it, but so, it has to be done systemically. So, right, for, for each of you, you know, Kim, uh, with respect to your daughter, Michael, with respect to your students, uh, who are also somewhat, right, your students, Michael, are somewhat older than Kim's daughter. Uh, but, um, but you had in, right, you had an audience of young people, of children. And I'm wondering, uh, I mean, the, I guess the general question about, as you were thinking, Kim, about, right, writing this book uh, to meet a need that wasn't met in the materials and the few materials you could find, and as Michael, as you were doing something very similar, um, I'm wondering what were, what were some of the difficulties you kind of, or how did you think about how to do this, how to communicate this idea of systemic structural racism? And Kim, we'll start with you, but especially to a seven-year-old, which most people, right, would say, I'm mm -hmm. sure your daughter is very precocious, when most people would say, that's, you know, what, second grade maybe? That's, that's quite young. How did you think about how to do that? I mean, it, it was tough. I have to be, you know, honest again. I had some of those same, you know, um, fear. So it was not a slam dunk on deciding to, you know, put this book together. I was very worried, you know, about doing harm. Um, you know, for me, I was exposed to a lot of this material in college. You know, so when I started to think about structural racism, it was very empowering for me. It was motivating for me, it changed my life. And it had a lot to do with the career path that I chose for today. But of course, I was 18 and not eight, you know, so I was wondering, you know, could this really sort of undermine her own agency? Could this have negative implications for her self esteem? Could it hurt her ability to have, you know, uh, cross racial friendships? So it actually wasn't until I started reaching out to some of the people that I know that work with children and deal with some of these issues that I even felt comfortable moving forward. So one of the people I reached out to was a mentor of mine. Her name is Joan Reed, and she's actually Dean of Diversity and Community Partnerships at Harvard. And she's also a child psychiatrist 
and a pediatrician, you know, and I reached out to a couple of other friends of mine with pediatric backgrounds and another friend of mine who was a middle school history teacher and let them know, you know, what I was thinking. And sort of once they signed off on my approach, I knew I could move forward. And then, you know, once I decided to move forward, I was able to put on my research hat. And the main question I was asking was, what does the evidence show, you know, in terms of laws and policies, um, what does it show about what has been most impactful for the circumstances that we find ourselves in, you know, today? And, you know, what I did once I figured that out, I thought, okay, I want to do a little bit, you know, different from what I had seen. So, of course, you have to address something like slavery. But, you know, what I did that I hadn't seen done was really draw out that economic motivation, you know, for slavery, and then tie that economic exploitation directly to the wealth gap that we see across racial lines today. The other thing that I wanted to do is sort of show the way that the little subtle dehumanizations really laid the foundation for something, you know, like slavery could continue. And then how does that a uh, little dehumanization track to the police brutality, you know, that we see today. And I took that same approach of really looking historically and tracing a line directly to the present with other issues like voting rights, issues like uh, segregation, you know, other things that I wanted to do um, was definitely show the agency, you know, of people in col of color. So I highlight a couple of different movements, a couple of different key figures that you don't tend to see in the second grade social studies textbooks. The other thing that I wanted to do was really show how people have wa uh, worked across racial lines, both in the past and the present, in order to, you know, combat racial injustice and improve, you know, inequity. So I was very um, cognizant of paying attention to the way that illustrations look and how they represented diversity, you know, across these movements. And, you know, once I had that foundation, what I find is an ability to take um, events from today and kind of harken back to that. So I can say, you know, to my daughter, remember that part um, in the book where we talked about voting and, you know, how voting was made more difficult, you know, and she's like, oh yeah, the poll tax and stuff like that. Like well, I said, oh, well, you know, we're passing some laws like that now in different states. So I'm able to, you know, really kind of reiterate over and over with different examples from everyday life. So it becomes um, much more concrete to her and not something that's specifically relegated to the past, but that's something that is, you know, manifesting today. And then something that she also has agency, you know, to address today. Let me ask you, um, Michael, of course, we're coming to you in just a second. Let me ask this one follow-up, Kim, which is, <clears throat> so first of all, the name of, the, of Kim's book, The Cycle of a Dream, A Kid's Introduction to Structural Racism in America. And you've told us some of the choices you made um, I'm wondering, as you said uh, at the beginning, or as you reach out to your mentor, you reach out to others, it wasn't obvious uh, how you were going to do this work. Um, not surprisingly, we have a lot of questions in the registration and, and already some um, in the chat and the Q&A uh, from folks who are wondering you know, how do they speak uh, to their own children of varying ages. And I'm wondering if along the way of writing the book and thinking through how you're going to communicate to your daughter and to other kids, if there were paths you decided not to take, uh, pitfalls that appear to you and that you avoided that uh, others may want to avoid. I'm also mindful that, mm -hmm. of course, you've been talking about the book. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe in conversation, you know, along the way since its publication, you've, you've come up with some things that you want to, as it were, warn people against. Um, you know, definitely, you know, something that I, you know, tried to stray away from was being too graphic. You know, I was really of the mind to try to get, you know, the point across, you know, without necessarily having to frighten children. You know, my daughter is extremely sensitive, you know, so if I shown someone, you know, getting lynched or somebody getting beat, you know, um, it would have been extremely traumatic for her. So, you know, that was one, you know, um, thing that I was very cognizant of. How do I actually illustrate these, you know, qualities in a way that, you know, um, rings true, but does not inflict unnecessary, you know, trauma on kids. Um, another issue that I, you know, kind of referred to beforehand is 
how do you now um, take these historical events and bring them into the present so kids can recognize them in their everyday life. So now how do I tie a line from you know, lunch counter sit-ins to the Black Lives Matter protest. You know, so really trying to you know, bring these things you know, um, into the present. So I think you know, those were some of the things that I really wanted to focus on. One of the things I did do is actually sort of borrowed a lot of the uh, template from her social, bu social studies books. You know, so I really try to mimic that, you know, so it was not so jarring in its presentation. And I just really wanted to make sure that I just gave a little bit more context. So it's not, you know, things that they, you know, have no sort of touch point for being exposed to, but I just add a little bit more context to slavery. You know, why did that happen? You know, uh, how did sort of racialization, so to speak, play a role, you know, in the ability of Americans to enslave people. So I just kind of draw out some of these things. I kind of keep a similar template and then I move things from the past up to today. So those are some of my key strategies. Yeah, I just want to <laughs> thank you, uh, Kim, so much for underlining that point. And of course, the four of us talked about it before as well, of yeah, drawing that connection, right? And talking mm -hmm. about contemporary, like right. today, dynamics, you made a sort of a loose um, allusion to the voting rights, mm -hmm. right, and, and voting sort of regime changes in Georgia, yeah, for example, right, in, talk, in Texas. Yeah, in our house as well, yeah. Um, and, and I just, I'm underlining it because, you know, as we know, it's very, very tempting for a lot of people, right, in acknowledging uh, sort of the ugly racial history of this country mm -hmm. to insist that the 60s were a tipping point. Before the 60s, we had bad things and then, you know, mm -hmm. the 60s happened and, you know, there's some magical mm -hmm. things going on and, you know, now we're all good, mm -hmm. right? And that any issue, any residue from the past is, is just that. It's just mm -hmm. residual. It happened then, it continues to trickle out a little bit and, you know, next thing you know, we'll be all good instead of acknowledging, right, the, the live, active uh, mm -hmm. perpetuation of inequities that, that we're dealing with. Mm -hmm. yeah. So yeah, uh, Michael, we want to turn to you and um, see what difficulties you had or things you in trying to present this material, uh, sort of lessened, lessons learned that might help the, uh, you know, guardians, parents, teachers, others out there. Um, yeah, so I mean, I think part of it for me has been um, it's been a it's been a very intentional route to the materials that we've we've built, right? Um, we knew that. Uh, so I have a, I have a team. I have an advisory board and now board of directors for self evident education, and it's a group of folks who, you know, I've been working with on and off for you know the past thirty years. Um, one of my close collaborators is a multimedia visual artist by the name of Bayate Ross Smith. Um, who's a professor at NYU Tisch, uh, just a brilliant, brilliant person. Um, and very early in, in the process, when I first started explaining the idea to him, right? And so for me, part of what happened um, in, in, the, uh, in the process was I was in the classroom. I had been an English teacher for most of my career, teaching with sort of the soul of a social studies teacher. Um, and I uh, had an opportunity to teach social studies, but was told with about a week left in the summer that I was going to be teaching American History One. Um, and I thought, you know, uh, I can do this. I, I was an African American studies major in college. I became a teacher because I wanted to use it as a space to dismantle systemic racism and white supremacy. Um, so I know I knew the lens that I wanted to, to teach through and I wanted to teach in a way that would engage my, my students through story and through multimedia narratives, right? That's sort of king in, in um, within the, the students that I was working with. And so I came to Bayate with the idea. I sort of explained, you know, here's what I'm trying to find and I can't find it. Can we do something to make this material that doesn't exist in the classroom? Um, and he was very clear very early on that if we wanted to do this, we needed to make sure that the materials that we were creating were um, universally applicable across a wide variety of contexts, right? He, he was like, we can't just make 
documentary films that are built for the classroom and that's the only space we need to make these in a way that will engage people in conversation in all different levels and types of places so right now Bayate um, is doing a, a program called uh, the art of justice where he's teaming with um, law schools and district attorney's offices and he's presenting um, art that creates conversations around social justice issues because the idea is so many of our future policy makers right like kim talked about the the, the policies that we need to um go go after those policy makers come out of those spaces the law schools and the district attorney's offices right so he was very clear from the beginning we need to make this really high quality material and i was sort of just like well you know look at the stuff that's out there it's not going to be that hard to make something that's better than that and he was really 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 pushing on you know making sure that we we put this together in a really accessible and engaging way um i think the other piece that's that's been really interesting um, and it just sort of comes out of the work that I've done in in my life, right? So the the work that I have done in understanding the way that race has functioned in America as it relates to whiteness and anti-blackness, right? Um, and that's been the, the, the focus of my scholarship and it's the expertise of the team that I have surrounded myself with. Um, and I think that so much of the way that race has and does function in our society comes back to the ways that it was built on these ideas of whiteness and anti-blackness. But that was a that was a, a choice early that that those were the stories that we were going to focus on, hoping to eventually expand and bring more people onto the team and really get into some of the ways that that race intersects in a whole bunch of different ways. Um, I think also, you know, I'm constantly aware. I, I've been asked so many different times some version of uh but you're a white guy why do you why do you do this work right and and generally my answer would be some form of my origin story but i think over years and years of doing this work i've i've realized that i i think the calculus on that question is 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 slightly backwards right and and so what i what i really wish people were asking me is but you're a white guy why don't more people like you do this work right and i'm reminded of a, a a response that octavia butler gave brilliant in octavia butler's brilliant fashion she was asked why there weren't more black science fiction writers um and she said uh her response was because there aren't more black science fiction writers um right we do what we see others doing and you know she said fortunately i didn't have the sense to not do it um and so for me i think you know, this is this has to be uh, uh, an issue that white people in this society are um, an active part of fixing, right? Because it's it's been a system that has been built up supposedly in our name, and so we need to be an active part of of solving that. And so I'm constantly thinking about my positionality um, and how it fits into the into the work. Yeah, and Michael, so, thanks for that. I think your mic may be rubbing or, or against. Yeah, I don't know if it's, maybe it's my yeah. headphones. Yeah, maybe no uh, headphones, yeah. Yeah. But um, so uh, one more question before we go to um, audience questions, but a lot of people actually are asking variations of this question, which is, um, you know, so often when we talk about, uh, you know, being adults in the lives of children and supporting them to negotiate something, to understand something, in this case, obviously structural racism, systemic racism, uh, it's very easy for we, the adults having the conversation, to act as if we all get it, right? That we, you know, when in fact, these are terms that are really very mystifying for a lot mm -hmm. of people, including adults. Mm -hmm. So I think a lot of people, a lot of adults, will acknowledge uh, that they don't know exactly what this means, right? Yeah. Um, and a lot of the people who would say, yes, I understand what it means, actually mean quite different things by it. Mm -hmm. So we have a number of questions. And again, along the way of the work that you've done, I'm guessing that you've come across, right? Are there some starting points? Um, you know, you know you, Michael, you mentioned Kendi. Uh, and of course, he's someone a lot of people are reading but you know, for people who don't want to go through however many pages of stamp from the beginning, um, you know, are there some 
websites that might gather. I mean, we have uh, Embrace Race certainly has some resources, you know, mm -hmm. shorter resources, a collection of them. But are there things that you would lift up that really helped enhance your understanding, Kim? I'm going to say um, the 1619 podcast by the New York Times. So I love that podcast. It's a um, great introduction, you know, to the way that structural racism operates in a number of facets, really, really accessible. So it's six episodes ranging in about 29 to 41 minutes uh, a piece. So you can get a really firm foundation in less than a week, you know, if you're so inclined. I know we're all starting to drive again, you know, so that's kind of a great way to get introduced to this topic. Then another thing I want to uh, highlight just because she takes a little bit of a different take on it. I want to highlight a book by Heather McGee. So it was recently released and it's called The Some of Us, The Cost of Racism um, and How We Can All Prosper Together. And what she really does is trace these policies and laws that were meant to target Black people, but that have ultimately ended up compromising the quality of life of all Americans. So I think that's a um, great way to think about how our present, our past and our future uh, are linked and how it's all in our vested interest to try to dismantle structural racism. Those are awesome suggestions. Yeah, Michael will come to you in just one moment. I just wanted to add that, you know, one thing that happened, I remember when I was in graduate school, we uh, a literature, you know, an amazing literature started which continues around uh, the historical and contemporary sources of wealth inequality, mm -hmm. racial wealth inequality. Uh, Brandeis, Brandeis University actually has a center focusing on, on wealth and racial wealth discrepancies. And again, their sources mm -hmm. and especially their consequences. Mm -hmm. um, we tend to think of sort of income, right? What you get in your paycheck and wealth, the accumulation, you know, the value of your house, of stocks, if you have them, those sorts of things as, you know, gosh, is not kind of the same. It's really not. <laughs> the same. Um, and so, yes, the, Kim, the uh, recommendations you offer, Michael, the ones you offer, we'll throw in a few more. And we will send out, right, the link to this mm -hmm. recording, the transcript, and, and, and all of, these resources yeah, as and, well. And Kim created a great resource for us that we can share as well. But Michael, do you want to just toss out a couple, three sort of manageable and useful <laughs> resources in the space of structural racism? Yeah, um, I mean, I would say uh, anything by Audre Lorde or Bell Hooks. I think um, for me, Pedagogy of the, Pre of the Oppressed by Paulo Freire is not necessarily a book about American racism, but it talks a lot about the ways that oppressive structures get get reproduced within the systems that exist in oppressive systems, right? And so, you know, for me, working in the education space, I've got to understand it is an institution within an institutionally racist system. And so the education system is going to be by default a, a racist space that we need to, to undo. Um, I would recommend anything that James Baldwin wrote or spoke. I think that Baldwin, um, I often think he must have gone through uh, life feeling like Cassandra from Greek mythology, like he was he was cursed with prophetic vision that no one was going to listen to. Um, you know, the things that Baldwin was saying during his lifetime are so true to, to, to now. Um, he, he wrote this gut-wrenching short story called Going to Meet the Man, which I think shows some of the ways in which um, you know, poisonous, when poisonous soil is sown, it reaps poisoned souls, right? And so if we don't get to the root, the radical root of, of the soil problem, we're going to keep producing poisoned souls. And I think that Baldwin said that brilliantly in, in, in so many different ways. Um, the last, the yeah. last uh, one that I'll, I had one, I can't remember what, it, oh, I'll bring it back because I said it earlier. Um, I I think seeing white the the podcast from seen on radio i think for particularly for you know white people who are um you know sort of new to the process of thinking about where they fit in this uh in this work and this equation i think that seeing white does a really um good job of of breaking that down and the host john bwin is is really um great at sort of being honest and transparent about his his own work um yeah and then i mean i know it's 582 
pages, but people like for real, read this book, <laughs> stamp from the beginning. I read want it. To, I recommend listening to it. I, and I want to just on Baldwin, um, he uh, did a couple uh, high profile debates uh, which you can find actually on YouTube, one with William L. F. Buckley and mm -hmm. one with a Yale professor whose name I'm forgetting, but they're both mm -hmm. online if you do James Baldwin. And his, I mean, <clears throat> his brilliance is just staggering. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So highly recommend yeah. those. Please. Yeah, but I do the, um, Kim, you're saying some of the same things that uh, educating yourself, right? Because it's really slippery. I remember Andrew, you writing about it um, in your work, sort of in sort of academic circles about structure many years ago and saying like, people use this term all the time and they don't know what they mean. You know, and I'm gonna try to figure out what you know. So this is sort of continually sort of, and it's slippery, right? Because it's, uh, it's that's why systemic racism, you know, is allowed to sort of stand because it's sneaky, you know? Um, but there are a lot, a lot, a lot of questions about once you do do that. So there's no, um, there's no substitute for understanding more and continuing your learning in every way about race because it's very complicated. It doesn't totally make sense, right? It shifts. And uh, these are messages we can also give our kids, but we have to sort of understand and be learners ourselves. Um, but I'm wondering about, you know, we've gotten questions about at every age level, you know, do you talk to kids about structural racism and how do you do it? And I'm, I'm really, um, I was really taken because this is the way we do it as well by people sort of always want a book and there are great books, you know, to read with kids. Um, and Kimberly, you wrote a book, you know, and there, I, this is a great book that talks a little bit about, um, um, it's for preschoolers. So it's not, you know, it's only about structural racism, but it does talk about unfair rules, which I think is a great way to talk to young kids about unfair rules, um, about, about structures you know, procedures. Um, but it, it does seem that both of you talked about using examples that were very immediate in, in the lives of uh, the kids that you, the kids in your lives, or Michael, you talked about your, that was a great example of your father doing that around the Dukes of Hazard car. Um, that there, there can be no substitute for that, right? Um, but I wonder, uh, I wonder if you all can sort of riff on a bit on, um, examples for say the, the youngest set, let's say, um, you know, preschool uh, through middle school, like how do you, are there things you think of that are sort of great uh, terms or language? I think with little kids, again, um, uh, unfair rules um, and fair unfair are great sort of simple ways to break it down. But I'd love to hear your takes. Yeah, I, I mean, I think you guys are raising a lot of important points. The younger you are, the more concrete you are, the less abstract. So a lot of, you know, um, your questions are going to just be pertaining to more obvious sort of physical differences. So just being upfront, you know, about those sorts of things, you know, something as simple as why somebody has, you know, uh, darker skin, you know, tracing that to, you know, differences in melanin, but not anything reflective of any, you know, innate differences, you know, in terms of humanity, you know, so tying some of those basic um, things that those kids are going to be interested in. And I was, you know, reviewing a couple of studies where they've started to, you know, approach the issues of structural racism with kids as young as six and have found, you know, of course they do it in some simple ways, you know, uh, but have found that kids can get it, they are receptive to it, and they actually, you know, are appreciative of it. Um, you know, one specific study took some biographies of um, some famous people in, you know, historical African-American life. So somebody say, for instance, like Jackie Robinson, and what they did is they presented all the, um, sort of positive information about him and everything that he did and contributed to, you know, one group of six-year-olds. But in a different group of six-year-olds, not only did they add all that positive information, they actually put some information in about uh, the discrimination that he faced, about him not being able to play, you know, um, baseball because of his skin. And the kids actually, you know, were more responsive 
you know, to the version of the biography that actually included, you know, that information with respect to his discrimination. Because the other interesting thing to, you know, think about that a lot of people have a lot of misconceptions about is the fact that kids are picking up on these racialized differences in their environment and coming to their own conclusions anyway. Mm -hmm. You know, so they're acting out some of these structural racism dynamics by the time they're four or five anyway. So what you do, you know, when you don't have um, the uh, discussions with them is you lose the ability to actually shape the narrative and you leave them to, you know, come to conclusions on their own. And, you know, nine times out of 10, what they come to is the idea that one group, whether it be race, whether it be gender, is inferior to another, you know, so we have an opportunity, you know, to uh, intervene. Mm -hmm. And Kim, you know, one thing I hear you saying, I want to build on just a little bit. Um, you know, we're talking about building blocks, right? Mm -hmm. So I think it's no, it isn't necessarily mm -hmm. the case that you're trying to talk about structural racism per se, even using other language with your two-year-old. Mm -hmm. But with your two-year-old is, you know, as with other things, is building on some basic bits, you know, core bits of information. So you talk about skin color but phenotype, right? So now we're getting into what race is and what it isn't. Mm -hmm. um, and another piece of that, I think, uh, which very much taps into what you just said, Kim, is this idea of deservingness, right? How do people, do people, are people's circumstances a reflection of their character? Mm -hmm. The answer is not necessarily, very often not, right? So uh, we have um, a colleague, a professor at NYU does research, she found that those children, four-year-old children, who understood that, you know, the person in the rich house, right, and the sort of large, lavish house, we couldn't infer that that person was smarter than anybody else, harder working than anybody else, et cetera. And the person in the uh, house that didn't look nearly as lavish, that looked like a poor house, wasn't necessarily deserving of, right? So this idea that, well, there's a lot that intervenes right. between the person and their circumstances. So it was like kids who explained the rich house differently had different responses to the children. Yeah, right? children who said, look, no, I don't know anything about the person in that house, what kind of a person it is simply because she or he lives in that house. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's something we're teaching from very early and becomes a building block for explaining things like structural racism, right? Mm -hmm a bit later. Michael, what's your, what's your thinking? Um, you know, so I wish my wife were here in the room with me. She's a first grade teacher and she's always telling me about, you know, the, the brilliant things that she does with, with her students. I don't unfortunately have a bunch of books off the top of my head, but what I can say is how, um, important it is, you know, the work that you all are doing. I'm, I'm in a program at Mount Holyoke. There's a teacher there who's a preschool teacher. And one of the things that she is working on as her capstone is trying to develop professional development resources for preschool teachers that specifically look at social inequity, racial inequity, social justice, you know, in, in a way that that fits in this sort of preschool um, mode, because, you know, what she says is every time the district brings in um, professional development around social justice in the classroom, it's always pitched, you know, second grade and higher. And there's no one coming to talk to them about how do you have these conversations with with young children. Right. And I think um, there's you know, there, there's a there's a piece to if we can be more intentional about the ways that we educate our youngest children, then we don't have to undo the harm that's been done at, at a later age. Um, and so, you know, I wish I had a list of 50 books that I could get. I'll get them from my wife later and I'll and I'll email them all to you. Um, and also, you know, I think the other piece, I think the, the other thing I will say, I saw some some talk in the chat earlier um, about, right, I just saw Sesame Workshop, right? Um, I think Makita Mays-Green, who's the president of the Self-Evident Education Board, is in the room now. 
brilliant, brilliant lady doing a bunch of work with folks at, at Nickelodeon and Sesame Workshop and all of these places to get these conversations happening in a more, um, you know, so that so it's every day. It's the com- it's not a, it's not a thing where you're like, oh, we're going to talk about this now. And it's scary. It's a this is a thing that we've all been talking about from, you know, when we were little. Um, and again, you don't have to then undo it. You don't have to undo the 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 myths and the lies that have been told um so i mean just hats off uh andrew and melissa to the work that you do um i'm i'm i i just i love what you're doing i love the the idea behind it and bringing all these people together i mean look at this there's 800 plus people in this room right now like to me that is is incredibly hopeful and i'm just like this is energizing and exciting thanks for letting me be part of it <laughs> thank yeah. you um well, i'm just we're just we looking so at uh, all the questions yeah. we have yeah uh, so here's one and we mentioned this issue of books melissa mentioned it and again of course can you have your book um, we have pl- plenty of book lists for young kids and pl- plenty of books and yeah. And, you know, to be honest, um, so books are hugely important. Obviously, they're hugely important in the lives of many families, working with children in different ways, literacy, et cetera. And sometimes we feel uh, mixed, mixed feelings about books because, of course, they're relatively Mm -hmm. safe, right? You can get the book from the library. You can buy the book. You can bring it into your home, read the book, and perhaps thinking that's all the work you need to do. Uh, this question speaks to that. Do you think that for children and teens, uh, and presumably you see from the rest of the question, she means white children and teens, that getting to know people of color personally may have more effect than words and concepts? Mm-hmm. I'm thinking of speakers at school, storytelling or reading at kindergarten and nursery schools. Um, yeah, so just what do you have to say about mm-hmm. Yeah, how do you complement, how do you think about, right, having access to the resources the two of you have provided and engaging real people and how to do that? Just any any thoughts on that, Kim? You know, I think uh, she's hitting on a very important point. There is no substitute for developing genuine, you know, cross-racial friendships. That is really the gold standard for developing empathy. So that's what we're talking about here. Uh, People not having the opportunity, you know, to develop empathy. And what we're, you know, offering, unfortunately, you know, this country is structured such that, you know, many, many people will never have that opportunity. So, you know, what these books do is they serve essentially as a way of starting to build that empathy by proxy, if you will, by giving people a window, you know, into the lives of other people's experiences, you know, in a way, um, in the event that they don't have the opportunity to, you know, get that genuine contact. But, you know, if you do, you know, if you have an opportunity to seek out diverse spaces, you know, genuinely connect with, you know, um, diverse individuals, that will always, you know, be something of the highest priority, you know, for facilitating what we're trying to achieve here. Yeah, I mean, if we could eliminate uh, systemic racism just with the wave of a wand, right? We wouldn't, we'd, we'd do that if we had a choice between that and the interpersonal stuff, right? Because it would really take care of a lot of things, right? But we, we like to say that um, that we have to, uh, you know, structures uh, impinge on us and we create structures. So to create better structures, you need to create more thoughtful agents, you know? And so that I feel like is what you all are doing as well, that we also need kids to teach kids and teach ourselves to see things we've learned not to see and to uh, be on the right side of, you know, good change, right? And good trouble. Good trouble. Good trouble. So more questions, so many questions. Um, A question here about how, Michael, I'm gonna ask you this one. Um, How do you balance personal stories or experiences which might be easier uh, for kids of all ages to understand and serve as helpful examples with truly systemic conversations that I imagine is something you think about a lot in your work? Yeah, I think that's a a great question. I mean, one of the things that we talked about a lot internally um, when we started the work at Self Evident was 
the power of story, right? Um, the power of stories to bring people into conversations that they might not think they're ready to have, or they might be more resistant to if, if you come at it in a different way. And so really looking for those narratives that connect people to a story, right? Humans, we, we love narratives. We love a good story, right? Uh, and, and it helps us bring meaning to, to the world around us. Um, but when you can do that in a way that helps you see the ways that those individual stories were influenced by the structures of the, of the society within which they live, we're developing a story right now um, about an enslaved woman who was uh, brought to Massachusetts in 1845 by the by the people who claimed to own her in Savannah, Georgia, and she comes with them to to Northampton, um, and telling the story of this one individual woman allows us to then uh, sort of zoom out and look at all of the ways that the systems are involved in influencing her agency um, and and her decision making. Right there's there's this sort of industry happening that we see where people are traveling to the north from the south during the summer months and they're bringing their enslaved people with them and essentially slavery is existing in the north right just under under a different name and different systems and structures um but it's this one story of this woman Catherine linda that's been written about in you know maybe one line in in a history book ever right and you can really dig into this story you tell the story and then uh you sort of you know jedi mind trick people into into really considering how that one individual story relates to bigger and broader structures and i mean going back just really quickly to the question about interpersonal relationships right i mean i will forever discount anybody who tries to drop the line like i have friends of blank whatever culture it is like i can't be racist but having friends from diverse groups and colleagues from diverse groups makes you so much more likely to be anti-racist, to be actively anti-racist, to be able to see the truth in the lived experiences of those people who you see as as your family, right? You 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 believe the 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 experience as opposed to discounting those experiences because you don't see the humanity of those people. So we um we thank you, Michael, uh, for that. We're almost at time. I want to get in one more question because it's such an important one. I'm going to start with you, Michael, and give you the last word, Kim. Uh, and the question, really, and we, we've touched on this certainly more than once. When, for example, Kim, you know, you said, "Yeah, how do I talk to my daughter about this without?" Um, uh, I forget exactly the language you used, but without squashing her sense of agency. Right, mm -hmm. essentially without making people despair, because these are, mm -hmm. you know, we talk about structural racism, that's daunting, that's, mm -hmm. that's formidable. And of course the history that you're both telling in your work is daunting hard history. So yes, we have a number of questions. And again, Michael, I'll start with you. Do you have a couple nuggets for how do we engage students, perhaps especially students of color, right? Students whose, whose people are, are getting the short end to say the least in, in so much of this telling. Uh, how do you engage them? How do you keep them relatively safe while dealing in a meaningful way with, with the stories that have to be told? I think, I think number one, um, and I don't know if Nathaniel Swanson is in the room, but one of my interns, Nathaniel, you know, said it very brilliantly and just uh, you start with joy, right? You look yeah. for the places where there is joy uh, in the face of concerted efforts to dehumanize, right? So, so you find that joy in response to dehumanization. I think um, additionally, in in any of the stories, particularly, you know, again, as a historian, looking at stories of history that we're telling, we're looking for the humanity of the individuals within those stories, particularly the humanity of people who are from groups that have been systemically and, and historically dehumanized by the structures in this in this culture. Um, and then also, you know, I think uh, in, in the face of historical oppression, there has always been an equal and opposite resistance to that oppression. And so really grounding the stories in the ways that people resisted the, the oppressive systems, I think is, is, you know, are some of the ways to keep that, that space safe. I think we've got public school educators are 
80% white identified, uh, many of them females, right? So a lot of uh, female identified people. And so a lot of, uh, you know, students who are, um, you know, are, are, are black and brown students are being taught by, by white educators, right? And so one of the things that I would say, you know, Malcolm X said, you got to educate your home community, bring it back to your home community. And so to my home community, which is educators, mostly white, um, you know, I say you need to be open and you need to be honest and you need to be transparent and you need to let those students know that you are yourself a product of a system that has intentionally hidden this history and this analysis from people in order to separate and dehumanize and it dehumanizes all of us, right? So we together, me as a white educator and whoever my students are, are in this work together in a partnership to reclaim our humanity. Right. And so I think if you if you recognize that and you're transparent that you're there to learn with them by doing that, you know, you you can create some of that safety um, in the work that you're doing. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Kim. The last word is yours. Uh, I will echo, you know, everything that Michael said, but I would just will add to that. It's really, really important that you allow kids to exercise their agency to make change. And this can be in small ways, large ways. If it's, it's something like attending a protest, if it's something like volunteering for an organization, um, a lot of the studies have shown when you couple this information with these messages of resilience and this ability to, you know, um, exercise agency that kids self image, particularly kids of color, their self image actually increases. Where if you don't do that, if you just give them this information about these structural impediments and convey mistrust without conveying their ability, you know, that's where you start to see the depression develop. That's where you start to see the acting out develop, you know. So what were we doing this weekend in my family? We were actually at a stop Asian hate rally you know, I think it's important for um, not only for my kids to exercise their agency, but to stand in solidarity with other marginalized groups and start to find their communities there as well. Beautiful words, beautiful Wonderful. insights, yeah. resistance, resilience, joy, agency, we can act. We can act. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for your action. Uh, huge, important. Thank you so much for your insights and information today. And thank you to uh, the many, many people who tuned yeah. in, to Bunch of Linguists for your fantastic interpretation. Yeah, to Chris, as always. our showrunner. And um, we will be sending you all those resources. A lot so, of stuff. Yeah, so we really appreciate it. Let's keep the conversation going always. Thank you, Thanks. Kim. Thank, thank you, Michael. Thank you all.